Yeah, so I'm Maitri Siddhi, for those of you who don't know me, and I live at Taroka Retreat Centre in Wales, UK. And um, yeah, I've been asked to talk about Dharma Chanda, the first of these four powers that Shantideva talks about in uh, the Virya chapter on the Bodhicharya, in Bodhicharya Vatara. Uh, so I just loved that, uh, that quote from the Pali Canon that Virya Devi quoted in her talk just, just before. Um, so this is, this is Virya. The striving and onward effort, the exertion and endeavor, the zeal and ardor, the vigor and fortitude, the state of unfaltering effort, the state of sustained desire, the state of not putting down the yoke and the burden, energy, right endeavor, this is Virya. It just, it just gives you this kind of like woof kind of feeling, doesn't it? It does, does me at any rate. Um, and so what my talk is specifically about is this aspect of sustained desire, the state of sustained desire. So, um, yeah, so this is Dharma Chanda, this desire that Shantideva is talking about. And what is that? It is desire for the pleasures of the Buddhist path. So we've got Dharma, you all know what that is, and Chanda, um, desire, um, longing, hungering for, wanting, inclining towards. Um, so uh, I don't know if you've recently had a look at Shantideva's Virya chapter. He's very, um, he's very full on, isn't he, Shantideva? So these verses about Dharma Chanda, they come after a whole bit where he's gone, uh, and I've been practicing, but I haven't really done anything, and it's hopeless, and have I comforted the afflicted, and have I um, developed all these perfections? Oh no, I haven't. I need to do something about this. Uh, and he sort of goes on like that for a number of verses in a uh, very Shantideva style. Um, and then he says, out of the fear of suffering and while meditating on the praises, one should create desire. And a bit later, the sage has sung that desire is the root of all skillful deeds. So is it, you know, is desire the root of all skillful deeds? Because in a way, if we're thinking of desire as craving, as karma chanda, desire for sensual pleasures, well, hang on a sec, we've got the Four Noble Truths. Um, wasn't craving supposed to be the cause of suffering? But here's Shantideva saying, no, it's not the cause of suffering. It is the root of all skillful deeds. So how can this be? Um, so what I love about Shantideva's presentation, among many other things, um, is uh, basically he's taking our clashes, he's taking our unskillful mental states, and he's saying, use them. Use this, um, use this energy, you know, there's all this energy that isn't necessarily in pursuit of the good. How can we take it, you know, how can we harness all the energy of our craving and our longing and our wanting to get satisfaction outside ourselves? That is where our energy is. How can we use it like, um, you know, like a sailing boat, a dinghy? Um, it uses the power of the wind to push it where it wants to go, and it can go very fast. But you don't just go in the direction that, of the wind, do you? It's like you use your sail, so you use the power of the wind to take you where you want to go, not where the wind wants you to go. So, um, okay, here's another couple of verses from Shantideva. Um, and, uh, well, anyway, okay, I'm just going to tell you the verses. Uh, one should be addicted solely to the task that one is undertaking. One should be intoxicated by that task, insatiable, 
like someone hankering for the pleasure and the fruit of love play. So, you know, have you ever lusted for a lover? You know, have you ever felt like actually um, all your happiness is just, you know, you, you just, you're just waiting until you see them and then you're able to enjoy the pleasure and the fruit of love play. You know, that draw to, um, I don't know, move towards someone and all your delight is bound up in them. And Shantideva is saying, can we feel about the Dharma like we feel about a lover? Next verse. One cannot get enough of the sensual pleasures in cyclic existence that are like honey on a razor's edge. So normal pleasures, it's like you're licking honey off a razor and it cuts your tongue. You know, you're trying to get the sweetness, but there's pain with the sweetness. Shantideva again. Um, how can one get enough of the benign, ambrosial acts of merit, sweet in their result? So if we're lusting and longing and addicted to the pleasures of the world, um, which have pain bound up in them, uh, can we actually um, just re, sort of like redirect that longing so that what we want is the acts of merit, the, the Dharma actions that are purely sweet in their result. We're not licking honey off a razor. Uh, we just get the honey, how great. So I think the question for me is, you know, Shantideva puts in these provocative verses where he's saying, well, do we relate to the Dharma like a lover? Are we addicted to the Dharma? And um, actually, it's like he's sort of saying, well, can we do that? Because when we really want to do something, actually, we do it. And if we just think, oh, we ought to do that thing. Well, we may do it for a bit, but actually, we probably won't do it for very long. So this area of Dharma Chanda, hunger for the Dharma, um, it's pointing up the need for pleasure in our Dharma lives and the need for us to notice, well, where do we get pleasure in our Dharma lives? Okay, so this is, um, this is a quote from Bhante from The Yogi's Joy. I've really enjoyed doing this talk because it's got, it's got a whole load of my favourite quotes in it. Um, so uh, Bhante says, Human beings are ruled to a great extent by pleasure, and we can't function well without it. If you haven't enjoyed anything for a long time, if you haven't experienced some thoroughgoing happiness and delight recently, you will tend to feel listless and drained of energy. Enjoyment is not a luxury not something peripheral to the main business of practicing the Dharma. It is not an element to introduce if there is time. It is central to the whole exercise. Only joy will keep us going in the spiritual life. So I really, really like this. Um, I really, really like this. Um, so I think the question that comes to my mind is, uh, and maybe actually this is something that we could talk about in the breakout groups, is, uh, well, where do we get joy in our Dharma lives? Uh, does that, um, you know, where do we get sort of pleasure or fulfillment or satisfaction or delight? Is it from meditation? Um, is it from communication and friendship? Is it from Dharma study? Is it from communicating the Dharma? Is it from puja? Um, is it from retreat? You know, do you see what I mean? It's like, and then when we notice, oh, where do we get pleasure? Um, then we can consciously notice it, bring it to mind as a practice. 
So Shanti Deva says, well, how do we, um, so desire, this is the root of all skillful deeds. Um, how do we develop that? And he says, the root of developing it is ever meditation on the resulting consequences of our actions. So we've got this noticing happiness and delight, um, which is, uh, and can we notice fruits of our practice? So for instance, if I don't meditate in a day, I really notice, it sort of feels like I haven't showered or cleaned my teeth or something. It's like I haven't washed my mind. Um, not everybody has that, but I, um, I imagine all of us can notice, oh, what are the positive effects when I've gone out of my way to be kind to someone? Um, what are the positive effects when I've made the effort to turn up to a Dharma event, including on Zoom? Uh, and we can consciously notice that. Now, Shanti Deva, of course, um, has a whole load of um, sort of purple prose about um, talking about, uh, I don't know, evil deeds uh, ending us up in hell where we're going to be cleaved in pieces and burnt on molten copper and stuff like that, um, which I think most Westerners probably don't really like that sort of thing. I tend to have quite an extreme mind, so I quite like it because actually um, uh, the sorts of negative mental states I get, actually those verses of Shantideva, like that is the inner experience for me of being in really, really difficult, painful, negative mental states. And actually I don't want them. I don't want them. So I have quite a strong practice, which is trying to notice this, um, like the shallow end so um, in my mind, do I just notice, oh, I've got this little resentful story running. And then I can think, ah, oh, what are the consequences of me leaving this little resentful story running? Is this where I want to go? Is this who I want to be? Uh, and usually I think, mm, no, actually. Uh, so we've got two sides to looking at the consequences to bring into being desire. We've got the really focusing on the pleasure, the beauty, the joy, the delight. And then also noticing, oh, well, what are the effects if I don't practice? Do I want them? Is that what I want to say yes to? And Shanti Deva also has a whole load of verses, of course, evoking well, what happens when we do practice the, the Buddha life and then we're sort of awakening in a pure land with the petals of our lotus opening and the Buddha teaching us the Dharma and we're effortlessly being swept on a wave to enlightenment. Um, and that's very nice too. <laughs> it's probably uh, not what I'm in contact with all the time in my day-to-day -day life, uh, but I really like it as a, as a sort of vision of what can happen. me just getting my second page of notes out. Um, so Dharma Chanda can take us a long way. It can really produce um, energy in pursuit of the good, virya, and cause us to commit to our practice and really want to do it because we're going to get rewarded. But it is limited. It is limited. And it is limited because it is still based in a sense of self. So there's me here practicing so that um, I can get nice experience later. Do you see what I mean? It's still kind of like me based. If I do this, I'll get a reward for it. I mean, I really prefer being... Um, a skillful, positive version of me. I mean, it's much, much more pleasant when I'm in good mental states than when I'm not in good mental states. Um, but at the same time, well, what happens when, um, well, maybe we hit a dry patch and actually meditation isn't pleasurable or we're having difficulties in the Sangha or suddenly sometimes like, you know, our Dharma practice just goes flat. 
if Dharma Chanda is our only source of virya, actually at that point, our Dharma practice will fall over. Or it could be, and I, I sort of think this happens, you know, when you start off in the Dharma life, changes happen quite quickly, don't they? And you can really see the result of, you know, someone says, oh, try generosity. And you're like, wow, I never thought of that. I'm going to try generosity. And, you know, you notice it really lifts your mood and you feel like, you know, I know for probably about the first five years, I just felt like I was changing like every day. But then like the longer you go on, it's like, it feels more like um, nowadays, like I'm grappling with really, really deep root sanskaras and actually they're not giving up without a fight. Sometimes I almost get a sort of visual image like I'm, I'm wrestling with a many headed snake and, you know, no sooner do I manage to kind of get on top of one and, you know, another head sort of come up and trying to entwine me and, um, and actually sometimes it doesn't feel like there is a lot of pleasure going on. It's just like this hard slog where it's like, I think, oh, I do want to do this. Um, and I keep putting in energy and I keep putting in energy, but actually there's not much coming back in the way of um, fruit. So this is the point where um, Dharma Chanda needs to act as a bridge into faith, Shraddha. And we had Prakasha um, telling us about how every faculty is the basis for the next and um, uh, and sort of yeah, leads to the next. And he was talking about faith becoming the basis for virya. So, um, oh, I'm wanting to go in two directions, which you can't do. Yeah, okay, right. So know your mind about faith. Uh, Bhante is talking about how the defining feature of faith is actually you keep going even when there is no pleasure. In the, when in the midst of a desert of suffering, one stays faithful to one's practice, then one can be sure that it really is faith that sustains one's practice. And he also says, there is, there has to be a certain kind of pleasure in faith. But it is quite different from the kind of pleasure that is unrelated to faith. And it's true, isn't it? It's, uh, it's like, even when things are hard, there's, I can still be in touch with a sort of satisfaction of like, um, actually, I took somebody else into, into account then. I wanted to do that. It's like I'm in alignment with something that is bigger than me. This is what I want my life to be about. So how do we make that move from Dharma Chanda, getting rewarded by pleasure from our Dharma lives, to faith where we can persevere even when there's not obvious pleasure? So I've got three suggestions that occurred to me. Um, so first, it's something, it's an awareness thing, really. Tuning into the felt sense of, um, well, it's the felt sense of clinging when I want something out of my Dharma practice. Um, and when I don't get it, it's, it's not okay. Is that boring meditation okay? Is that led meditation where someone talked all the way through and I darn well wanted to meditate? And just noticing, do I get that kind of clinging or a sense of irritation or resentment? And then I'm noticing, oh, that's a bit sticky. Um, actually, that's not pleasant, that sense of stickiness. But then when I'm simply longing, wanting to move into being a bigger version of me, it doesn't have that stickiness. So I'm hoping that makes sense, kind of like noticing in our experience the felt sense of clinging. And then I think there's a whole area around faith, around um, just allowing our longing 
allowing that to be okay. Um, and it might be, um, it might be longing for ourselves, like, a, or a quality, like longing for a sense of ease or longing for a sense of freedom or a lessening of a tension that we live with. Or it might be longing to ease the sufferings that we see in the world. And it's quite painful actually to open up to that sort of longing, either for ourselves or others, because it's, we have to let ourselves want it without there being a solution. We're not going to be able to just get ease and freedom for ourselves like that. We're not going to be able to ease the suffering in the world just like that. But it requires us to be more open, like just open our hearts to be able to want it. It can feel sort of quite scary, quite demanding to be able to open to, to allowing our hearts to want what we want on a really deep level. Can we allow what is ultimate in us to resonate with what is ultimate in the universe? We don't have to create it. It's like it's there. Can we just let it resonate? And then my third point is about the Bodhisattva ideal, like particularly as framed in the sort of classic Mahayana tradition. So I completely love the whole thing about like dedicating myself to the sake of enlightenment for all beings over countless eons, countless lifetimes, world systems throughout time and space. And there's something about the, just the vastness, the bigness of that vision about what spiritual practice is about, where like my little calculating mind that wants to work out how to get something out of it for me, it's like it's just got nothing to go on. It's just got to fall over. It's just got to give up. And then something much bigger in us can open and just say, um, actually, I just want to dedicate myself to this. I don't care if there are outcomes. This is what fulfillment is about. This is what I want my life to be about. So I'm going to finish with uh, a quote from Banti from the survey, uh, where he's talking about actually, in the end, we can't be practicing the Dharma life for our own sake, for pleasure we get. And ultimately, we can't be practicing just for the sake of others. That too is limited. Actually, um, it's just this whole bigger picture where all of that just drops away and um, uh, you're just doing it because that is, um, I don't know, that is what life is about. Like that is us moving towards our fulfillment. So this is what Banti says in the survey. Not for our own sake, not even for the sake of others, should we seek to attain the divine, but simply and solely for its own irresistible sake. <laughs>